It's March. Welcome to the Teens Cornerstone Connections lesson. In this quarter, we're stepping into the realm of royalty, kings and prophets, reaching incredible heights. The title of today's lesson is Faith on the Mountaintop. With our wonderful panelists, Kimberly, Misati, Irvin, and our wonderful teen teachers. With angelic music straight from our orchestra, Shema on the violin and Sabira on the clarinet, appealing to the deaf community in sign language, interpreting the whole conversation, we have Joyce. Be blessed. Praying all day. That is the title of our mission story today. My name's Amy. And today we're looking at Jennifer's life. Jennifer is 12 years old and lives in northern India. More than anything, she likes to pray. At home, Jennifer prays as soon as she gets up in the morning. Thank you, Jesus, for the good night's sleep, she said on a replay to my mom, sitting on the brown and pink bed sheets on her bed. Thank you for the new day, Jennifer said, praying in Hindi, her native language. Please bless me throughout the day. Please also bless my uncle, my aunt, my cousins, and our neighbors. Please especially bless father and mother. Amen. When Jennifer sat down for breakfast, she prayed, Dear Jesus, bless this food. Amen. She said again, speaking in Hindi. She, then she eagerly ate her breakfast of rice, dal lentils, and chapati flatbread. She is an only child, and she eats breakfast with mother. Father eats later. When Jennifer was ready to leave her school, she prayed again in Hindi. Dear Jesus, please bless the day. She said, please help me as I learn in school today. Help me to remember what I have studied for my quiz today. Amen. Then she picked up her backpack filled with textbooks on math, English, social studies, Sanskrit, and handwriting. The backpack also contained pens, pencils, notebooks, and her lunchbox. At school... 450 children gathered in a big room for morning worship. Jennifer often leads the children in prayer from the stage. And she said again, and she did again that day, all the school classes are in English. She prayed in English. Our Father in heaven, she said. Then she paused so other children could repeat after her. Our Father in heaven, the 450 children repeated in chorus. Hallowed be thy name, Jennifer said, and all the children repeated after her. Together, Jennifer and the children completed the prayer, saying, Your kingdom come, your will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our debts, as we forgive our debtors. And to not lead us into temptation, but deliver us from evil, from the evil one. For yours is the kingdom, and the power, and the glory forever. Amen. At 1 p.m., Jennifer packed her lunchbox, unpacked her lunchbox in the school classroom and prayed, Dear Jesus, bless this food. Amen. She said again in English. She had been studying in English all day, so it was easy for her to pray in English as well. Then she ate her lunch of cabbage, cauliflower, potatoes, and chapati flatbread. In the afternoon, she had a math quiz. She prayed, Dear Jesus, please help me to remember what I have studied and to get a good grade. At home, father prayed for supper. He joined Jennifer and mother for the meal of rice, paneer cheese, and vegetable. Jennifer liked to hear father pray. Dear Lord, please bless this food, father said in Hindi. Bless the hands that prepared it and those who have provided us with the food. And please give us good health as we eat. Amen. At bedtime, Jennifer prayed with father and mother at family worship. The creator of heaven and earth, we thank you for keeping us safe throughout the day. Jennifer said in Hindi. Then she prayed for the family, for, rel for relatives, for neighbors, and for a good night's rest. After that, she lay down under her brown and pink bed sheet and closed her eyes to sleep. It had been a good day. It had been a day spent talking to Jesus. Part of this quarter's 13th Sabbath offering will help to construct a new school building for Jennifer and for the other students in Ani, India. The 450 now study in an old building that was built by a German missionary who founded the school in 1976. Thank you for helping Jennifer and her classmates build a new school building.
Indeed, faith is the victory. Good morning, good evening, good afternoon, happy Sabbath. From wherever you are watching us, it is a joy to be here once again with you. And uh, boy, do we have a lesson for you today. You know, uh, our lesson today is entitled uh, Faith on the Mountaintop. Faith on the Mountaintop. And before we begin, before we dive in, I just want to introduce our panelists here. Perhaps they could just say their names, and then Arvin can pray for us. Eh? Yeah. It's so happy feeling the time of day you're at. My name is Misati Nyambane, and I'll be glad to go with you in this journey. Uh, hi, my name is Arvin Mosomi. I'm happy to be with you. Good stuff. Happy Sabbath. My name is Kimberly. I'm happy to be here with you. Amen. Arvin, please pray for us. Uh, let's pray. Dear Heavenly Father, we come into your presence seeking guidance for the lesson that we're about to go through. Now as we begin it, Lord, may you guide us in each step. In just name I pray. Amen. Amen, amen, amen. Welcome once again. And so ladies and gentlemen, today our lesson is entitled Faith on the Mountaintop. And it's all about Elijah and what kind of faith he had when he defeated those prophets of Baal. Right? And so for us to dive right in, I'll just bring in uh, Kimberly here with the what do you think section. Kimberly, uh, tell us what do you think. Okay, so here we have the question. Mm -hmm. When I see others in my life doing something I think is wrong, I usually, so we have some choices. I ignore it, I join in, I tell them what they're doing is wrong. I keep quiet unless they ask me what I think, then say I think it's wrong. Um, and the last one is, in a kind, caring way, provide positive advice and point them to a better way that is possible through Jesus. So, I'd pose the question to my panel. What do you think? Right, so, personally, what I do, okay, if something's wrong, as in wrong, wrong, not wrong because I think it's wrong, when, when it's wrong, that's not an opinion, in that it's either contemptible constitutionally or morally, societally, that type of wrong. When it comes to opinion, I'll mind my business because my opinion is my opinion of someone else. But otherwise, I'd tell them it's wrong. I wouldn't say I'd point them to Christ because I'm like, you know what? Hello? I, I, as in, of course, a lot of people in my life are not necessarily Christians, nor do I know your God. Okay. It's, it's, a bit, <laughs> it's a bit odd. But I'm like, you know what? I'll point out that this I feel is wrong because I feel it deviates from proper human behavior or from the way you ought to live. You know, the certain things that we all agree universally are wrong. Yeah. So you'll tell them? I tell them what you're doing mm -hmm. at this point is wrong. That's, that's what I do. Mm -hmm. Then I'd leave them to figure it out. Mm -hmm. uh, I feel like sometimes if it doesn't involve me in any way, I mostly just ignore it. But if I see someone like my friend or my close friends doing something that I feel is wrong or I know is wrong, I always reach out and tell them, hey, what you're doing, are you sure you're doing the right thing? But sometimes I leave the choice up to them. I don't really force them to do something. I just ask them, yeah. Yeah, so you're, you're probably in the middle between uh, ignoring yeah. it and the last one. Uh, yeah. Okay. What about you, Kimberly? Tell us, what do you think? Uh, for me, I think it depends on our closeness. If you're close to me and I see you messing up, I don't actually know how to keep quiet. So like, I'll address the issue and tell you like this is wrong. And I would also point you like in a positive way how you can do better yeah, through yeah. Jesus. Yeah, so we can agree that generally, if the person is close, we'll tell them. You know, yeah. you're, doing, yeah. you're not doing wrong. Right. Okay, what about the second part, Ashi? So we okay, have... Sorry. We have the second part, um, and the question is, if I'm doing something wrong, I appreciate it when others in my life. So we have the first one, don't bother me about it, mind their own business, Respectif respectfully tell me where they think I'm making a mistake, uh, talk to others and leave me alone. So I think I'll answer this first. Um, I feel that I appreciate it when people respectfully tell me yeah, that they think I'm making a mistake. Because that means that you care about me and you want the best for me. So you want me to correct my mistake 
and move forward in the best way. Mm -hmm. Okay. What, what about you, Gail? What do you think when somebody comes and tells you off? Or rather... <laughs> I think the, the, the key word that I look at it would be the word is respectfully. Ah, respectfully. Respectfully means that based as in, because the person may not know my values, but a person who would, like, okay, a person who doesn't know my values, either way should be respectful. Someone who knows my values would be like, I think this is what you value, so why aren't you living up to what you value? But someone who doesn't know my values is like, you think this is okay? And in that case, I'd be like, you know what, my values allow me to do this, this, that, or the other. To give a slightly interesting example is there are people who drink and who are open that they drink and never in any way mention anything wrong about drinking. Like someone just say, you know what, drinking is okay, drink in moderation, it's all right. That's someone's mm -hmm. values. Mm -hmm. And when they're drunk, they do not engage in any rowdy, unruly or behavior they regret. That's their values. So in that case, if I go up to someone and ask them by that, why do you drink? Someone says, you know what? It's my values. And drinking for me, because I do it in moderation, the same way you eat chapati in moderation, mm -hmm. I might. As in, so if someone were to bring it up that way, that's different. Mm -hmm. Nonetheless, either way, I've respectfully aired my opinion. They have respectfully aired their opinion. And we have come to an agreement. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Okay, okay. What about uh, you, Avin? For me, I feel like... Uh, I like people who probably also respectfully tell me off because it's not like someone who comes to me and tells me, aren't you a Christian? Why are you, why are you doing this like in public? So I, I like people who probably call you aside and tell, tell you, hey, what you're doing uh, it might be disrespectful. Not someone who will be like, don't you go to church every Saturday? How, how do you do this? Aren't you the one who normally giving out the Bible verses in class? Yeah. So yeah, someone who respectfully called you off yeah 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 that's an interesting point you know i think the key word there is uh, respectful but then you know we'd be lying to ourselves if we did not admit that uh, there is some uh, <laughs> there is some uh, there's some air of controversy whenever you're telling somebody you know you're doing something wrong eh? you 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 know you're getting into his face you know you're almost getting into their business you know there's an air of controversy yeah and today we want to look at a story just like that. Uh, and uh, Avin, maybe perhaps you can tell us uh, this into the story. You can read it or maybe you can summarize it, uh, whichever uh, you're comfortable with. I'll just read it through. Yeah. It begins, Elijah said to the prophets of Baal, choose one of the bulls and prepare it first. Since there are so many of you, call on the name of your God, but do not light the fire. So they took the bull given to them and prepared it. Then they called on the name of Baal from morning till noon. Baal answered, Baal. Answer us, they shouted, but there was no response. No one answered, and they danced around the altar they had made. At noon, Elijah began to taunt them. Shout louder, he said. Surely he's a god. Perhaps he's in deep thought, or busy, or traveling. Maybe he's sleeping and must be awakened. So they shouted louder and slashed themselves with swords and spears, as was their custom, until their blood flowed. Midday passed, and they continued the frantic prophesying until the time for the evening sacrifice. But there was no response. No one answered. No one paid attention. Then Elijah said to all the people, Come here to me. They came to him and he repaired an altar of the Lord, which had been torn down. Elijah took 12 stones. With the, t with the stones he built an altar in the name of the Lord and he dug a trench around it. He arranged the wood, cut the bull into pieces and laid it on the wood. Then he said to them, Fill four large jars of water and pour it into the in on the offering and on the wood. Do it again, he said, and they did it again. Do it a third time, he ordered, and they did it the third time. The water ran down around the altar and even filled the trenches. At the time of the sacrifice, the prophet Elijah stepped forward and prayed, Lord, the God of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob, let it be known today that you are God in Israel, and I am your servant and have done all these things at your command. Answer me, Lord, answer me, so these people will know that you, Lord, are God, and that you are turning their hearts back again. Then the fire of the Lord fell down and burnt the sacrifice, the wood, the stones, and the soil, and also licked up the water in the trench. When all the people saw this, they fell prostrate and cried, 
the Lord, he is God. The Lord, he is God. Mm -hmm. Amen. Um, so we just want to go out of the story, yeah? And just look at a few things, eh? So, you know, at the beginning, we can see that this is a very controversial method to solve this dispute, you know? Yeah. Why do you think, and this is just to the panel, you know, why do you think, you know, Elijah thought it a good idea to challenge the prophets of Baal in this way? You know, he could have, as we said, when in the, what do you think? You know, he could have called them aside, told them, you know, yeah. you whatever you're doing is not right. Eh? <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> but he told them to kutane Mount Sinai, uko ju. You know, it's almost like a bully saying, let's meet three o'clock in the car park, mm. you know, challenging them. So, just the first question. Why do we think he decided to do it in such a public way? I think what strikes me is his rallying call was guys, like Israelites, decide. For him, that was yeah. it. He was just like, you know, you guys, it has been three and a half years. Mm -hmm. You have been tormented without rain, but you are still on the fence between Baal and Yahweh. Yeah. As in, you, you are just you're on the fence. So, for him, it was like, you know what, you guys... I want you to make a decision. Mm -hmm. Like, I want to give you an opportunity to see for yourself which God is God. Mm -hmm. that, so for him, he had to challenge them like that. Mm -hmm. Because it strikes me, he wasn't trying to change the prophets of Baal. Yeah. He wasn't. Those yeah. Not, that was not the target audience. Yeah. The target audience was the Israelites. Uh -huh. And as a result, because the bull was slaughtered in public, yeah. we have every right to yeah. know where the head and yeah. tail went. Yeah. Wow, that's so insightful. What the rest do you guys think? Um, I feel that Elijah made this decision because he wanted to show that, you know, like this is like the final time we've been disputing about this for so long. And this is the best way to show that God will come through for us. You know, because if it wasn't like this extravagant, they wouldn't take it seriously. But then he knew that God is not like a God to let you down and not come through for you. So this was just to prove a point and yeah, just glorifying God all through. Yeah, he wanted to prove a point. He had a target audience and he yeah. wanted to prove a point. What about you, Avin? What do you think? Uh, I feel like Elijah at this point was like, now everyone, you're going to witness for yourself. He thought someone is going to tell you a story that, mm. oh, we went up the mountain. This is for you to see, for you to tell your children. Elijah at this point was tired. He was tired of fighting for Israel, and Israel was not fighting for themselves. Mm -hmm. So he said, now you, I'm going to do something that mm -hmm. Baal prophets can't do. Mm -hmm. And from there on, I'm done. You pick your God, me, I'm, I'm, I'm finished. Yeah. yeah, yeah. those are interesting points. Huh? Now, there's another part of the story that we can see that Elijah actually taunts. It's almost as if he's flexing, you know? He yeah. taunts the prophets of Baal. He tells them, uh, you know, poor. No, even before he says four water, he tells them, uh, shout louder. You know, yeah. maybe your, your God is on a hiatus, you know. And even when it's his turn, he tells them, pour water on the sacrifice, you know. Yeah. Why do we think he's doing this, you know. Why, why you know, it's, it's one thing to be humble. But then here we can see that Elijah is almost flexing the power of his God. Eh? Yeah. Why do we think he does this? He's, he's boasting his God. He's showing people that my God, he's doing this. Your God, you've prayed from morning till noon. Me, my God, let me show you. I'm going to pour water on this to make it that me, I'm not, I'm not the one who's putting this fire. I'm going to pour water more. I'm going to make it almost impossible to set a fire on this thing. But then my God will bring fire from heaven because the, the Baal prophets didn't put water on the altars. Yeah. They prayed from morning till evening. They cut themselves, but nothing happened. Yeah. So he was almost taunting them at saying, my God is more powerful than your God. Yeah. yeah. And simultaneously, Elijah, his mission wasn't to be humble. That was Moses. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> that, was, that was totally Moses. Yeah. Moses was the one who was the humblest man before God. Who was like, I, I cannot speak. So he just chucks a snake. Yeah. Just like, hi guys. Yeah. Yeah. And the snake just swallows. Like really humble. Yeah. The guy just splits the sea. Just, as in for him, he won the battle. Remember that battle? He won the battle by raising his hands. Nothing flabbergasting yeah. or huge or humongous or brilliant. Yeah. But now, Elijah's mission was that he was here with fire and brimstone. That's yeah. how, like, in Second Kings 1, we remember the way, like, like 51 men struck down at once with fire. Yeah. Uh, Elijah says, I, I guarantee you I can call fire and fire will come. And yeah. fire came. Yeah. So I think for him, that was his mission. His mission was when 
when the Israelites had gone so far away from God, the only thing that could bring them back was miracles and miracles yeah. of a huge nature mm-hmm. so that was why elijah was there and that's why he had to die and then he died he was taken up by a chariot of fire yeah for them to know that truly this is a man of God. yeah yeah it's almost to 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 set up god you know exactly. in order yeah. to, to to prop him up as as, as who he is eh? all right so now we just want to move from out of the story and go into the key text and we are really looking at at the faith of Elijah. How was Elijah able to do all of these things? You know, who was he looking at in order to do them? Huh? Uh, and we just want to go back to Kim. Kim, if you could read for us the key text. Okay. Uh, so the key text comes from the book of First Kings, 18 verse 36, and it says, Elijah stepped forward and prayed, Lord, the God of Abraham, Isaac, and Israel, let it be known today that you are God in Israel and that I am your servant and have done all these things at your command. Amen. Amen. And so from this key text, we can see that Elijah essentially is looking towards God for him to prove that indeed it is him who is working through him. Right? And it's so interesting to see that even all that showboating that he was doing, pouring the water, was that God's name may be glorified. Uh, perhaps, Misati, if you could just read for us the flashlight and just highlight, you know, that showboating that he was doing um, and maybe reference it to the key text as well. Uh, yeah. So, yeah, the flashlight is God can use, cannot use men who in time of peril, when strength, courage, and influence of all are needed, are afraid to take a firm stand for the right. He calls for men who will be faithful and do faithful battle against strong Wearing against principalities and powers, against the rulers of darkness of this world, against spiritual wickedness in high places. So clearly, God requires people who will take a hard line stance. Mm-hmm. Someone who would actually be all out mm-hmm. with their faith. Mm-hmm. Now, I'd like to ask you like a few questions mm-hmm. to tie this in. Yeah. So let's say you are at your friend's house and then they bring out a crate of beer and they start drinking. Yeah. Uh, replace the beer with the wine, yeah. champagne. Yeah. Whatever soups your fancy, whatever your friends drink, I don't know, mm. maybe. Mm. Maybe your, if your friends drink or people you know drink. Yeah. So yeah. you're at your friend's house and it's like your friend and their friends and those friends and the other friends, they're drinking now. What do you do? Yeah, that's a good question. What do you do? What do you do, Kia? Mm-hmm. Okay. I think the first thing is for me, I always. If I'm in that situation, I make it clear to them that, okay, for me personally, I don't drink and I just like distance myself away from the alcoholic drink because I know they won't necessarily listen to me when I tell them like put it away or anything, like something to preach to them. So I just like distance myself. Yeah. Would that even involve leaving, leaving the, the party? Yeah, I would. Yeah. yeah. Okay. Okay. What, what about you, Avin? What do uh, you do? For me, probably, I'll start by saying, yeah, me, I, I don't drink. So don't, don't bring it close to me then. Mm. I probably go to my friends and tell them, yo, please, let's, let's not do this. If they refuse, I respectfully just walk away. I just go home. Mm. Nice. So my approach is I'll go to the ones who are not drinking. Because I think yeah. this has actually happened. Like, there's yeah. a time we went out with some classmates of mine. Yeah. Then, so some began drinking. So I, I stuck with the ones who weren't. So two camps of sorts. So I was with the ones who weren't drinking. Mm-hmm. But in the absence of those who aren't drinking, mm-hmm. I leave. Because I, yeah. I don't trust people when they are in an altered state. Yeah. At least like that. Mm. Okay. Okay. What's your second question? So my second question right here is, you notice someone is trying to cheat off your test paper. Mm. What do you do? <laughs> That's a good one. That's a good one. start here with the king. What do you do when somebody is trying to cheat off your test? You're in an exam room, you see him peeping. <laughs> He's trying to giraffe <laughs> onto your paper. <laughs> what do you do? So, I think I'll borrow from my past experiences because this happened when I was younger. Uh, the first thing was I moved my answer sheet away from them so that they couldn't see it. And then... I think that's my first alternative. And the second one would be, maybe after the test, I would inform the teacher. Mm. Okay, okay, inform the teacher. That's a good one. 
not like what about you are <laughs> some day giraffe will be okay for and you can see them you can <laughs> he's, uh, he's kicked your chair telling you where <laughs> i feel <laughs> like i feel like at that point there's some guilt where if i hide i'm fe- i'm being a bad friend you're being but a if bad i'm friend. also i'm also <laughs> keep showing them i'm also not being you're truthful being good, yeah so at that point well wow, that's I, right. I, Yeah. You know that's an interesting concept that you've brought, you know. And 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 it's your friend. Yeah. It's it's not a, you know, it's Some not like your enemy in class yeah. or your nemesis. It's your it's your boy. Some your guy friend. you have pangada formation with you know? So now I feel like at that point you just have to stick with your principles. Yes. <laughs> <laughs> that's I mean, a tough one. Yeah. I I've been a victim but now like That's why I don't have I don't have a definite answer. Yeah, well maybe we start yeah. what do you think? What what can we do? So my approach would be that I would make it very inconvenient to read off my paper. I'd ah. offer the opportunity that you can actually see it, yeah. but I make it extremely inconvenient yeah. such that someone has to be in such a weird position that the yeah. invigilator must see. You know, because yeah. I would want the invigilator to feel like they did something, you know? Yeah. The invigilator actually put effort so of course this person is in a very awkward position yeah. trying to read off that is then of course they'll get they'll get caught yeah otherwise if there's a lot of time in the examination i just cook i i write with false answers yeah. in pencil <laughs> yeah. they copy the false answers i erase i put right answers yeah. in that case because i'm like you know what i think at times someone would change when they feel pain yeah you know as in it feels pain that the yeah. person r- like wrote my answers yeah Then they flank I passed. Uh, just, yeah. By the way, you know, guy, afterward, the yeah. test results come out. By the way, cheating isn't nice. Yeah. yeah. This, this fail is evidence. Yeah. You know. No, that's true, that's true. But I think at the heart of it, what we're trying to say is that there are situations that are, are difficult, you know? And there are situations where you need to be able to be steadfast and say that, no, I do not agree with this. No, I'm not up for it. No, uh, we need to change. You know, and just be steadfast, and don't worry about the consequences. You know, fine. You know, it's very true. You know, he's your friend, and uh, indeed, you stand to lose a friendship. You know, you do. Yeah. You do. You stand to even with the alcohol. You know, you yeah. stand to lose a friendship. Maybe they'll not want to hang out with you anymore. They say, "Ah, oh, this guy is boring. Huh? Doesn't yeah. drink alcohol." You know, and it's very true. But we must stand firm, and we must be like Elijah. Um, I really liked what the what the flashlight said. Uh, and just to highlight it, you know, it said, uh, <clears throat> if we can all just stand there, it says, God cannot use men who, in time of peril, when strength, courage, and influence of all are needed, are afraid to take a firm stand for the right. You cannot be afraid. You must be strong and make that stand for the right. All right? Uh, and this is also there in, 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 in quite a few verses, and... Uh, highlighted there in our lesson, right in the punchlines. And so I just wanted to call on uh, Avin, just to take us through some of those punchlines. Tell us which is your favorite, and maybe you can have us read some of them too. Yeah. Uh, my favorite here is Ephesians 6, 10 to 12. Mm-hmm. Finally, be strong in the Lord and his mighty power. Put on the full armor of God so that you can take stand against the devil's schemes. For our struggle is not against flesh and blood, but against the rules the rulers against the authorities against the powers of the, of this dark world and against the f- spiritual forces of evil in the heavenly realms mm. that's yeah. a very good verse that's a very good verse it says finally be strong in the lord and in his mighty power um, maybe you can assign us to read the other verses uh, you can read uh, matthew 17:10 so matthew 17:10 Oh, Matthew 17, 20. Truly I tell you, if you have faith as small as a mustard seed, you can say to this mountain, move from here to there, and it will move. Nothing will be impossible for you. Amen, amen. amen. You, can, you can just relate that verse to Elijah. You can imagine yeah. the strength that it must have taken to stand up against all those prophets. Eh? Yeah. It, it, oh, it must have been tough. You just even think standing up, you think standing up to your parents is tough. Uh, yeah. Now you think about standing up to the prophets of Baal, 300, Jezebel herself. Huh? All right, yeah. what's the other verse? Uh, you can read Luke 117. Uh, Luke 117, and it says, And he will go on before the Lord in the spirit and power of Elijah.
to turn the hearts of their parents to their children and the disobedient to the wisdom of the righteous, to make ready a people prepared for the Lord. Amen. This is a wonderful promise, eh? saying that we will be given the power of Elijah to obey God. You know, the power of Elijah to obey God. I think Misati told us just earlier about how, you know, Elijah's whole persona was just about power. Mm. You know, yeah. going up to heaven in a chariot, you know, uh, calling fire down from heaven. At least two times, I think two times in my memory I can recall, three times, you know, calling down fire from heaven, you know. Mm. And that is the power that we are promised in order for us to resist uh, evil, you know, mm. and, 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 and seek good, which is yeah. uh, wonderful. There's one last verse there. Uh, you can read the... Oh, okay, uh, it says, Hebrews 11 verse 6, it says, Without faith it is, it is impossible to please God, because anyone who comes to him must believe that he exists and that he rewards those who honestly seek him. And this is just really encouraging us to have faith in God, have faith in God. And it's admonishing us and telling us without that faith, we cannot please God at all. We cannot please God at all. Amen? Amen. 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 Now, uh, Amen. we just want to go back and look at uh, some of the lessons that we've learned uh, from this lesson. Huh? Um, and just try to relate it to us, uh, Miss Sati. You know, looking at the story of Elijah, the story of faith that we have had, uh, and I know you've taken us very well through some of the instances where, you know, we are called to have a stand firm, uh, a stand, and, a stand and, and firm faith in God. But perhaps maybe, uh, you know, do you have any similar situations which you have faced personally? Or, you know, um, how would you react when others do things that you believe that are wrong? I know that we've already done that. Maybe perhaps just to highlight, you know, um, what can we really do to stand up for God in this situation? Uh, over and above what we have just said, just uh, uh, perhaps to encourage us in order to stand firm for God. Yeah. Yeah, so I'll, I'll take the first part of, of your question and I'll answer that because I feel the previous part, the, the second part, something we have covered really well yes, yes, true, through true. a lot of examples. Yes. So the first part on how like, like God can come through for you or like as how God has come through for me, like... Okay, my particular experience is, I think it feels nice to get what you want. As in for real, it actually feels amazing. Mm -hmm. When you actually know what you want and you get what you want, mm -hmm. that feels amazing. Mm -hmm. And that's actually how my, like, the university I went to, that's how it worked out. Mm -hmm. You know, so my parents were like, go to a public university. And for my own reasons, I was like, no, I want to go to a private university. So I told them, you know, guys, I need, to, I need money for my application. I realized they had cold feet, so I said, you know what? I'll do this myself. Mm -hmm. So I did the application entirely. Then the, the day I was supposed to submit my certificates for them to verify, like, I never went to River Road and printed them, you know? <laughs> yeah, <laughs> yeah, of course. They have yeah. to verify that. Yeah. So that very day I went to submit my certificates and my academic transcripts is the exact day. I was just like, you know what? Okay, it's, it's fine. They are legit. Good. You are admitted. Yeah. That's how I got admission. Yeah. to the university I wanted, to yeah. the course, exactly the course I wanted to do, yeah. even in the case where I did not have parental support, yeah. of course. Yeah. Uh, later they were like, you know what, guy, you made the right choice during your education. <laughs> they were like, you know what, <laughs> we fought you, yeah. <laughs> but you did what was right. Like, yeah. you knew what you wanted, you went for it, and in this, we're well, right, we support you. Yeah. yeah, yeah. And it just shows, you know, how to trust God and sometimes, you know, believe in, in, in Him and in and what He has uh, in store for you. Um, all right. So we've come to the end of our lesson, you know. And before we close, I just wanted to give perhaps all our panelists just a minute or two just to tell us what you think about our lesson. Uh, what parting shot can you give, really? Um, and, uh, yeah, and, and what can you encourage our viewer uh, in order to, 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 to continue in the faith? Um, we'll start from here. Kimberly, go right ahead. Um, so from me, my encouragement would be to call on God at all times and to never think that what you pray for is too small or it's too big because God is a mighty God and he will come through for you. He will not shame you at any point in time. Yes, and to have a lot of faith yeah. as you pray. Yeah, yeah, that's a wonderful insight, you know, that God will come through for us at any time. Uh, my parting shot is 
be an ambassador of your faith. Don't be someone who follows the crowd. Be someone who sticks to the principles no matter what everyone around you says. Amen, yeah. amen. Stand out rather than fit in. That's wonderful. Yes. Yeah, and at times, like Elijah, faith may, have, may call for drastic, firm, mm. and at times, slightly violent action. Mm. Yeah. Yeah, it's very true, it's very true. You know, the Bible is filled with stories of men who were great, not in and of themselves, but who were great because they trusted in God and that they were confident enough in that trust in God that that trust in God yielded results, right? Yeah. And, that's really, and that story really uh, uh, applies to us as well. Even we, if we trust in God and are firm in our belief in God and are confident enough to stand up for God before men, then indeed we shall yield the results. Amen. You know, the story of Elijah makes me think of one last point, that as a Christian, our agreement with God, our contractual agreement with God essentially is this, right? If we stand up for God, then he will stand up for us, you know? That's, that's the heart, that's the heart of our relationship with God. God tells you, stand up for me, and I'll stand up for you. And so we are encouraged to stand up for God in every situation, wherever you are. Let me encourage you, dear viewer, stand up for God, and he'll stand up for you. All right, we want to close. Thank you so much for being with us. Perhaps as we close, uh, Misati, you can say a prayer for us as we close. Yeah, so let's pray. Thank you, mighty Father, for your goodness, for your greatness, for your love, for your kindness. We desire that we may walk through and walk with you in your power, in your glory, and that you may be with us even in the lowly of moments, and that you may be with us even in the peaks of experiences. In Jesus' name we pray and we believe. Amen. Amen. amen and amen. Thank you so much and goodbye.